Amen. Well, good morning, Northwest Bible Church. It is good to see so many of you here today. My name is Dane Salter. I'm the Young Adults and Men's Minister here, and it is a huge honor to be here with you this morning, especially on a morning that feels extra early, right? That daylight savings is a killer. When I originally agreed to preach on this Sunday, I totally forgot about that little fact, and Neil conveniently forgot to mention it to me, so I'm starting to kind of pick up on his tricks, but that's okay. We'll, we'll move forward. Well, last week, we started a three-week mini-series entitled Buried Among the Kings, which I love because it sounds very Lord of the Rings, right? It sounds kind of epic. And Neil told the story of Jehoiada, a priest who, in a time of political instability and uncertainty, saw a moment, an opportunity to honor God by protecting his chosen leader. And in a time of chaos and doubt, he took one young boy under his wing and guided him to becoming king over all Israel, over all of Jerusalem, a king who honored God. And our theme for this series is God honors those who honor him. And we saw this in how Jehoiada was rewarded for his faithfulness when he died. He was buried among the kings. This morning, I want to look at the same story, but from a slightly different angle. This week, we're going to focus on that little boy who would be king. And we're going to ask ourselves, how do we become people who honor God? If God honors those who honor him, how do we as Northwest Bible Church become people who honor God? So let me open in a little word of prayer and we'll dive in. Heavenly Father, God, I come before you this morning completely humbled to be in this place. Lord God, I pray that you would speak through me this morning, God, that you would use this weak vessel, Lord, to bring honor and glory to you. God, open our hearts, fill us with eager anticipation of your truth. In your name we pray, amen. Well, in 1924, the Olympic world was shocked when the Scottish runner, Eric Little, refused to run in the 100-meter race. You see, Eric, who was nicknamed the Flying Scotsman, was the favored to win. Everyone thought for sure he's going to win. So when he refused to run, they couldn't believe it. What's even more shocking is the reason Little decided not to run. You see, it's not because he didn't feel well or he wasn't feeling up to the challenge. No, it's because the race was going to be held on Sunday. And Little, who's a devout Christian, believed that Sunday isn't just like any other day of the week. He was convicted that Sunday is a day to be spent in worship with the people of God. And so Sunday came. And the race came and went without little. He was in church. And you see, what's what's interesting is it's not that he had disdain for his gift, right? He loved to run. In fact, he's quoted as saying, I believe God made me for a purpose. But he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel God's pleasure. Little believed that God honors those who honor him. He didn't dismiss the gifts that God had given him, but he kept them in perspective of the giver of those gifts. And in fact, the following year, in 1925, he moved to China where he'd become a missionary and spend the rest of his days having surprisingly easy to start conversations about Jesus with people. As the people of Northwest Bible, we want to be people who honor God. We want to feel God's pleasure when we honor him. And so this morning, as we look at this story through a different lens, not through the lens of Jehoiada, but through the lens of Joash, I want us to think about three words. And they are this, surround, internalize, and trust. Surround, internalize, and trust. The first word is surround. Our first step in becoming people who honor God is to surround ourselves with other people who honor God. The first way that we become people who honor God is surrounding ourselves with God-honoring community. Now, let me be clear. What I'm not saying here is that you need to only have Christian friends, you need to only live in a Christian bubble and kind of keep the outside world out there. 
No, we need to be in relationship with non-Christians. We need to be physically proximate to non-Christians so that we can develop a heart of compassion towards them and so that we can invite them into conversations about Jesus. But let's be real. Following Jesus is hard. Amen? Honoring God is hard. We need to be surrounded by like-minded people who can push us and walk alongside us People who can remind us that we live in the pages of a story that is so much bigger than ourselves. And we see this illustrated in the text. There are two things that the author of Chronicles, of 2 Chronicles, wants us to see right off the bat about Joash's reign. In verse 1, it says, Joash was seven years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. Did you catch that? Seven years old. Seven. Are there any seven-year-olds in here this morning? Anybody bring bring their kid? No? That's right. Most of them are over in the children's building. They're not even in big church yet, and yet they're making the decisions here to run the whole nation. We don't let seven-year-olds decide what they're going to eat for dinner, much less call the shots for an entire group of people, right? Joash is young, and he's completely unqualified. Yet, he is the only rightful king from the line of David who's still alive. See, God preserved a line of his chosen kings through the line of David. And after the tragic massacre of his entire family by his own grandmother, Athaliah, that wicked woman that Neil talked about last week, Joash, young though he may be, was the only one left. So he's young. He's inexperienced. He's definitely not qualified. And yet, he's not alone. The second thing that it points out in verse 2, Joash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. Joash was young, but he wasn't left to just figure it out on his own, right? Jehoiada didn't say, all right, Joash, here's the keys to the kingdom. Good luck not getting overthrown. Hope it works out. And don't forget to eat your vegetables, young man. You know, he didn't just kind of say good luck with it all. No, Jehoiada honors God, and he knows the value of good community. Now, when I say community, we, we, we kind of hear that word in church a lot. It's one of our Christianese kind of churchy words, right, that we throw around but rarely do we really think about what community means. Well, Howard Macy, who's the author of a book called Rhythms of the Inner Life, says that to avoid thinking about community simply because we misunderstand it will deprive us of one of God's greatest gifts. He says the idea of community is, in a sense, from another world, a world very unlike our own. But it's neither from the world of communes in Vermont nor from the placid world of coffee and donuts that Christians share before they rush back to their isolated lives. No, community is from the world as God wants it to be. It is the gift of a rich and challenging life together, one that we need and can receive with joy. Community is meant to help us swim in deep, oceans. This is honestly why we push small groups so hard here at Northwest Bible Church, because we believe that the best first step you can take on your journey with us is by getting around other believers who can walk with you and encourage you and challenge you so you can feel the tangible hands of Jesus through other believers. And we see this in Joash and in Jehoiada. Because of Jehoiada and his teaching, Joash is able to step into a story that is so much bigger than anything he could do on his own. Remember, he's seven when he takes the throne. And Jehoiada's desire to honor God is fulfilled through Joash as he mentors him and gets to watch him grow to become a king who honors God. In verse 4, it says, It came after this that Joash decided to restore the house of the Lord. He gathered the priests and the Levites, and he said to them, go out to the cities of Judah and collect money from all Israel to repair the house of God annually, and you should do this quickly. 
but the Levites did not act quickly. And what's interesting about this is that throughout the book of Chronicles, the author uses how kings treat the temple of God as the standard of measurement for how they should be viewed as a good or bad king, as successful or not. How do they treat worship with God? And we see that Joash comes to Jehoiada and he sees the state that the temple's in. And he says, we've got to fix this. This isn't right. It's broken. Verse 7 tells us that it's not just old and dilapidated, like time didn't just kind of wear away, but actually that Athaliah, that wicked woman, came and ransacked the temple and stole all of the artifacts to be used in the worship of Baal. Baal was the pagan god that in many ways is the great enemy of Yahweh, the God of Israel throughout the Old Testament. So these sacred things were taken and used to worship this false God. And Joash sees this. And he's been raised by Jehoiada, instructed by Jehoiada, and he says, this isn't right. If we're gonna be people who honor God, we need to be people of worship. So they get after this huge renovation project together. And what's really cool is that there's actually a little dispute between Joash and Jehoiada about who's actually going to do the work. Like, hey, it's a great idea, but who's going who's to float the bill? Who's going to make this thing happen? And Joash tells Jehoiada, hey, you and the priests, make it happen. Let's come together. Let's get it done. And they're kind of dragging their feet, hoping that he'll just like pay some people to do it. And so he actually comes and confronts his mentor. He confronts Jehoiada and says, hey, y'all need to pick up the pace. We got to get this thing done. And what I love about that is it shows that Joash is taking this worship seriously. Jehoiada's investment has made a huge impact in how Joash wants to lead. And so they come together and they set this donation box outside the temple. And in verse 8, the people of Israel rejoice and they're excited. They come, they give money so much that every single day the priests have to take the box and dump it out so that it can be filled again, and then they dump it out, and it gets filled again, and they dump it out because the people are giving and giving and giving because they want to be people of worship. They want to honor God. So in honor of this lesson, there is a tip jar in the back by the sound booth, and so feel free. I'm completely kidding, totally kidding. Well, please don't do that. This will be the last time I preach. No, but it's this beautiful moment that I love where Jehoiada gets to see all the hard work that he's invested in Joash pay off as they work together to restore the temple to help the Israelites be a people of worship. And at the end of verse 14, we see that they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada. Man, that's just a good little end right there. Let's just end the story. It's done. Now, if the story ended right there, this would be a really beautiful story. We've got the kings and we've got the priests all working together. They're helping. The house of the Lord is restored. People are worshiping Yahweh. All is good. But that's not where the story ends. The story doesn't stop there. We need God-honoring community around us, but we can't stop there. It's not enough to simply surround ourselves with good, with good counsel and just call it a day. We must also internalize, internalize the priorities of God. Community is vital, but you have to have your own journey with God. And we see with Joash the consequences of simply reflecting the value of the community around you. In verse 17, where we started reading this morning, he says, but after the death of Jehoiada, the officials of Judah came and they bowed down to the king and the king listened to them and they abandoned the house of the Lord, the God of their fathers, and they served the Asherim and the idols. So wrath and judgment came upon Judah and Jerusalem. You know, what I love about the story of Joash is that he's not an obvious villain. He's not a bad king from the start like the two kings before him or like Athaliah, the wicked woman before him. He's just naive and he's impressionable. 
I was talking through this sermon earlier with our women's minister, Angela Sirocco, and she was like, you know, he's kind of like Julia Roberts in The Runaway Bride, how she just changes how she eats her eggs with everybody. It's over easy with these people, scramble with these people. She doesn't know who she is. She's just adapting to the situation, eating her eggs differently with everybody. She just wants to be liked. She just wants to fit in. And that's how Joe Ash is. He just wants to be liked and respected by his peers. We can all relate to that. When was a time when you were scared to take a risk for God because you just wanted to fit in? Maybe it was with your friends or your coworkers or your own family, but you said, man, I could press in here, but I, I'm worried I'm going to take a hit, and I don't want that. If I'm honest, this is one of my biggest struggles with our vision, to have thousands of surprisingly easy-to-start conversations about Jesus all over our city. I love the vision. I love the idea. But I also want to be accepted and to fit in. And so there are certain people in my life that I'm, I'm hesitant to wade into those conversations because I'm worried that I'm going to be rejected. And the sad thing is, when we miss the priorities of God, we miss out on the power and the beauty of getting to work with God. Joash's leadership and ministry are never the same after the death of Jehoiada. It's never the same. Verse 18 tells us that as Joash listens to the princes of Judah, as he listens to these people, they abandon the house of the Lord. They start serving the Asherim and the idols. Asherah was this pagan god, goddess of fertility, and she had these wooden images that were kind of her symbols of worship. We don't really know what that worship looked like, but we do know it was often associated with Baal worship. And we do know what Baal worship looked like. It involved temple prostitution and human sacrifice. And the tragedy is we see this king who started out honoring God committing atrocities against the people of God, leading them away from the God who loves them. Yet God himself is still faithful. He sends prophets. He sends people to come and say, come back, turn back. You're you're going the wrong direction. But Joash doesn't listen to them. He's listening to the people around him, to his peers, because he just wants to fit in and be liked. And it's interesting how the author contrasts Joash's leadership before and after the death of Jehoiada. See, in the beginning of the chapter, Joash and Jehoiada are mentioned name by name, side by side, working together. But here, Joash's name is left out, and it's morphed into they. They abandoned the temple. They began worshiping idols. And the author's trying to show us But as Joash belongs to the the in crowd, he loses his identity. And he's no longer their leader. Now he's their puppet and he's their plaything. And he becomes so far removed from the man that Jehoiada knew and raised. He becomes so far removed, in fact, that when confronted by Jehoiada's own son, Zechariah, Joash doesn't listen to him. Either he rejects him and murders him on the very same spot that Zechariah's dad, Jehoiada, crowned Joash king. The very same spot. The story is full of tension and drama. We cannot rely solely on the spiritual pace of others forever. At some point, you have to break free from the pack and run your own race. In the world of running, one of the the biggest, most elite competitions is the Boston Marathon. In 2014, 37-year-old Meb Kofleski, it's a hard name to say, y'all look it up, say it three times fast, it's a great game with your kids. Meb Kofleski was the first American man to win the Boston Marathon in over 30 years. What was unusual about his win was that he took the lead in mile seven of this 26.2 mile race. And he maintained that lead for the next 19 miles. And usually in long distance runs like this, people run in packs. You see this, if you ever watch it on the TV, people run in these big 
huddles because there is advantage to that. There's wind resistance from the people in front of you. They block that out so you can run faster. You can draft behind them. You also kind of get into a rhythm with the people around you and you start feeding off their energy and their rhythm as they set the pace. Or so I've read, never actually done this myself, but usually what you see is people who break off from the pack early are almost always swallowed up by the pack later on in the race, never to break free again. And so when asked about his strategy, was that the plan to take the lead so early? Meb said, my goal was to do my personal best. I made a move and I said, come with me if you're gonna come. And this is what happened. That's what racing is. At some point, you have to break yourself from the pack and take the priorities of God to heart for yourself. Joash listened to Jehoiada's wisdom, but he failed to internalize the priorities of God for himself. And in the end, that leads to his destruction. We want to be people who honor God, and we know God honors those who honor him. So we surround ourselves with people who honor God, but we can't stop there. We also internalize the priorities of God. And yet the story of Joash brings up a very real fear. See, the tragedy of Joash is how this poor leadership, his failures, undoes all the hard work that Jehoiada did. All the investment, it's all undone with Joash's poor leadership leadership. And if we're honest, we fear that our hard work that we're doing for God isn't going to make a difference, which is why we need our last point, trust. We trust God with the results. There will be seasons when we feel like we are struggling and working as hard as we possibly can for God, and it seems like no one notices We wonder if anyone sees us, if anyone cares, if our work is really making any kind of an impact. If that's you this morning, I want you, I beg you, church, hear me now. God sees you. God sees you. He sees the hard work that you're doing. He sees you trying desperately to have conversations about Jesus. He sees you pouring day in, day out, trying to love the people around you, giving and giving until you feel like you have nothing left. God sees you. And God honors those who honor him. How do I know? Well, because the Bible tells me so. Second Chronicles demonstrates how God treats those who honor him and how he treats those who dishonor him. Remember last week's sermon ended with Jehoiada, a priest, being buried in the city of David among the kings. Even though he didn't get to see it, Jehoiada's story ends in honor, while Joash's ends in judgment. Verse 23 tells us um, that an army comes, and the Arameans come in, and they're a small group. Israel or the Jerusalem should have defeated them. Joash and his people should have been able to overtake them, but they weren't because God uses them as judgment. And so they lose. And Joash is left wounded. His friends, the princes of Judah, are either dead or running for their lives. And he's laying there wounded. And we read in verse 25, when they had departed from him, for they left him very sick, his own servants conspired against him because of the blood of the son of Jehoiada the priest, and they murdered Joash in his bed. So he died, and they buried him in the city of David, but they did not bury him among the tomb of the kings. Did you catch that? Joash, the actual king, buried in the city of David, but not among the tomb of the kings. Because God honors those who honor him. Some of you in this room, you feel like you're struggling away in obscurity. 
I want to challenge you, keep honoring God. Your efforts are not as overlooked as they may seem. Pete and Sandy Rife, when people were asked about, hey, who are some of the people who have invested in your life, who have made a difference in your life? Someone had this to say about Pete. said, I was super thirsty to learn more about Scripture, but the next class wouldn't be available for, for six months. And so Pete Rife sensed my hunger, and he did a one-on-one -on -one study with me on Sunday mornings. He sacrificed his personal time, and he loved me well. Someone had this to say about Sandy. He said, Sandy held my hand and listened to me cry after my husband died. And I learned from her that God can use our struggles to comfort others. John Boyton, someone said, when I told John that I didn't have a Bible, he went into the worship center, grabbed a pew Bible, and gave it to me. He said, use this till you get one, and then bring it back. He said, I felt trusted and valued. Trust God with the results of your hard work. He sees you. Even if you don't get to see it now or even on this earth, he will honor you. So as the band comes up, I want to end with a challenge for us this morning. You may notice, we can put all my points back up really quick. You may notice that my points spell out a word, S-I-T. Believe it or not, that's intentional, all right? If you want to be a person who honors God, there is no better way than to sit at the feet of Jesus. The Gospels display how Jesus, the Son of God, is the only one who trusted and honored God in all that he said and did. And we don't believe that Jesus is just a memory or a really good example, but that he is our risen King and that through him, we get to experience true community with God. So this week, every time that you physically sit down, whether it be at the breakfast table with your kids, or getting into the car to drive to work, or whether it be when you actually get to work, any time that you sit today at lunch after the service, I want you to take a moment just one moment to pray. Jesus, I sit at your feet. Help me to honor God. Let us be people who surround ourselves with community that honors God. Let us internalize the priorities of God. And let us trust God with the results. As we sit this week, let it be at the feet of Jesus. As we pray, God, Jesus, show me how to honor God. Amen.